My students regularly challenge me about uh, what's happened in the last two years and are we coming out of the recession or not coming out of the recession. And I think the answer to that is going to determine the presidency of the United States, frankly. And I think one of the issues they're very concerned about, uh, you know, the how the mortgage uh, fell apart and uh, how the whole thing collapsed. Well, I think that uh, one of the metaphors I give them all the time is there in, in, in the public parks in America where there are wild animals, it says, do not feed the bear, danger. And I want to tell you that's a lie. There's no danger at all in feeding the bear. And the bear wants you to feed them. The danger lies when you stop feeding the bear, and the bear comes at you and comes into your car and eats you. Uh, the system worked until something went wrong. And when it went wrong, everything went wrong because it was so tightly wound to each other. Right now, if you look at some of the analysis of high finance in, in America, the high finance people, they are physicists, not business majors, because they're doing the math at such an abstraction that is totally disassociated for meaning or real wealth but it is about the numbers. Jerry Wilkinson, a writer of the LA Times once said, the only difference today between the big shots of corporate executives, their accountants and their stock, uh, stock analysts, and bank robbers of the past is bank robbers at least use a gun and a mask to take our money from us. Now having said all this, I think the central problem of business ethics today is not the lack of moral reasoning or moral imagination but moral leadership. I don't think anybody leaves my business ethics class, and Gavin, I don't know about you, they leave your business ethics class and say, oh, you can't have two sets of books. I didn't know that. Oh, you can't double dip. Wow, what a surprise. You can't steal from clients. Well, I'm glad I took your course because I've been doing that for years. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, there's a direct connection here, not between what's right and wrong, but is leadership willing to enforce what's right and wrong? And I think that it's something really important to understand that today in a conversation that I luckily had with one of your uh, leaders in the field, Mervyn uh, E. King, and, and, with, uh, and with the head of the Jesuit Institute, Raymond, back there, uh, he talked about Mr. King categorically emphasized that without um, uh, enlightened and um, involved leadership at the top, nothing works. And that it's impossible to enforce codes, to maintain standards, and to be ethical. No matter what happens there, if, the, if you set the tone that don't tell me you know, what I don't know, I don't have to care about, et cetera, et cetera, you've changed the entire, I think, culture of an organization. And he was absolutely convinced that without leaders understanding what they want to do and understanding the people they hire, you're never going to have it. Now, the reality th is, I think as well, that leadership-like ethics does exist in theory, but it's only true when practice. You, I've written a lot of... Um, blurbs for, for corporations, and you know, we are concerned with ethics. People are our most important product. And then immediately the next day they're doing something else against it. It's not enough to say it. It has to be paid for. And in fact, you have, one of the things is, is there a budget for this? Are we going to actually do this? Newt Rockney, the famous uh, football coach of Notre Dame, I know we're two peoples divided by a different definition of football, but I'm talking about American football, once said, one person practicing leadership is far better than 50 uh, preaching about it. And I think that that's absolutely true in our private lives and in our business lives as well. Now, I want to uh, take a moment before we go on here to, to, to harken back before Enron. Remember where, when accountants were guardians of truth, literally gatekeepers. If you didn't know what you had, if you didn't know how do you make a loan, how do you make a, a business decision? So those numbers became important. It just wasn't a, just a, an accidental job. When CEOs were considered visionaries and celebrities, people we went to to ask uh, you know, wisdom, and not defendants doing the perp walk on you know, the national news that night with, uh, with the handcuffs on and being let off to jail. In America, there was a time when Lee Iacocca was not just CEO of Chrysler, he was CEO of Detroit and saved the American automobile industry. When Bill Gates and, and, and Stephen Jobs created a product and a way, every, every one of us you know, has this product one way or another uh, and change the way we think, we gather information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when even Andrew Grove from Intel or, or Jack Welch uh, from General Electric before he didn't read his prenup and had a very nasty divorce was considered Mr. Ethical uh, in the industry and it better anything go wrong. Uh, but think about today's CEOs in the spotlight or recently since Enron, Dennis Kozlowski of Tyco who didn't really ruin Tyco, he just robbed from it. So, you know, he was a nice guy uh, who did nine years in Attica, New York, not at a white-collar farm. He did hard time, et cetera, et cetera. John Regas of Adelphi, nice little Greek guy who started a whole industry by himself, all on itself, 
And then even when, uh, they went, when the IPO was there, he took some of that money and spent it uh, absolutely carelessly. And in some sense, I have sympathy for him, but I don't have sympathy for his two sons, one an MBA from Harvard, one from Yale, and they did it too, and one of them is in the, sale, uh, the cell next to him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Bernie Ebers uh, from WorldCom, the, uh, the famous uh, 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 phone company, an uh, 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 English teacher who will probably die in jail. Jeff Skillings from Enron was certainly going to spend, he's had a, s a sentence reduced from 28 years to 24. I'm sure he's ecstatic about that. Um, and, you know, and Ken Lay of Enron, who I'm convinced committed suicide rather than uh, face the piper and saved his money uh, for his family. And now the question mark, John Corzine, Corzine from MF Global, by the way, governor of New Jersey and senator from New Jersey, it makes it even worse. But having said that, you know, and I think you have to, you just can't limit this to, uh, you have some interesting things happening in the news here. It's been fascinating uh, to read all of this. Um, but uh, the politicians in America, and I'm from Illinois, and I want to tell you I can't, how proud I am that in my lifetime, four governors have gone to jail. Yes, four. Not three, not two, but four. Um, Otto Kerner, uh, <laughs> who's been, uh, who died. Uh, Dan Walker, who claimed that he did anything wrong as a governor, he would just embezzle people after he was governor. So a very important distinction. Um, uh, George Ryan and Rob Bogoyevich, who couldn't figure it out right to the end and now has gray hair because he can't diet anymore. And he's going to serve 14 and a half years because he just didn't admit, I'm a jerk. 